As we entered the new year, renowned investors have been sharing their perspectives on how the stock market will unfold in 2024. One of these notable figures is Steve Eisman, the big short investor, renowned for accurately predicting the 2008 housing market collapse. In a recent interview, he discussed four things. Number one, the possibility of disappointment for investors if current strong economic expectations are not met. Number two, the significance of seven major companies and artificial intelligence driving the market. Number three, the increasing U.S. national debt. And number four, the industries in which he plans to invest. Is the market wrong? You think that market fundamentals are actually good, but overall sentiment is too bullish? How do you distinguish? Well, I mean, think of it this way. Let's say we were here a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, most of your guests would have come in and said the earnings of the S&P are going to be down. The market's going to be down. The economy is going to go into a recession in about 15 seconds. And none of that happened. Um, the recession that never was. And so the market climbed the wall of worry the whole year. He is absolutely right when he makes this observation. At the beginning of 2023, the market was anticipated to be negative with projected decreases in S&P earnings. However, contrary to expectations, the third quarter earnings revealed a 7% increase in profits for American public companies. Essentially, the predicted recession did not materialize. The U.S. GDP experienced a growth of 2.6%, and the unemployment rate reached a historical low of 3.7%. Consequently, the global market transformed from a negative to a positive trajectory. The financial market significantly rallied throughout 2023, with the S&P price-to-earnings ratio rising from 22 to 26%. This shift in sentiment contributed to a 24% overall increase in the S&P in 2023. This implies that if you held an index fund like ATF, 75% of the gain had nothing to do with the company's profits. It was solely a result of the positive market outlook. Contrastingly, in 2022, the S&P price-to-earnings ratio started and ended at 22%. The overall earnings declined by 13%, leading to a downward trend in the stock market. In the last two years, 2022 and 2023, we observed two different types of markets. 2022 was characterized by an overall decline due to downward trends in earnings. And 2023 was where the market significantly shifted to a higher and positive side, driven by both earnings and a shift in sentiments. This shift in sentiment is something we need to be cautious about when making decisions. So far, there haven't been signs of either declining earnings or expectations that might drive the market towards a downward trend. So now here we are a year later, and everybody is, including me, is, has a pretty benign view of the economy. The only thing that bothers me is just that I, I don't think we're necessarily wrong on the economy. I think we're probably right. It's just everybody's coming to the year so bullish that if there are any disappointments, you know, what's going to hold the market up? Eisman believes that the economy will likely perform well in 2024, although there is a possibility of a reversal in high investor optimism. A significant part of this optimism is directly linked to the Federal Reserve's plan to cut rates. The Fed aims to reduce rates from the current range of 5.25 to 5.5 percent down to 4.6 percent by the end of 2024. Most members of the Fed's committee expect the rate cuts to be in the range of 4.25 to 5 percent. Financial markets have already priced in these expectations. The one-year U.S. Treasury bond rate is currently at 4.7%, reflecting investors' expectations that the rate will be around 4.6% by the end of 2024, maintaining a bullish sentiment. Short-term bond rates for the two- to four-month period indicate that the first rate cut is anticipated this month, rather than anticipating a decline in earnings, as was the case at the beginning of 2023. Earnings are projected to grow by about 11 to 12 percent. What is right in your view? Because the market believes that there's going to be probably two, at least two and maybe three at this point. I think the best, if you had to lay your life on the line, I'd say one. One. Unless there's a recession. If there's no recession, I don't see any reason why the Fed needs to be aggressive at cutting rate. I think the Fed is still petrified of making the mistake that Volcker made in the early 80s where he stop raising rates and inflation got out of control again. So I'm not that bullish on the Fed cutting rates. So if I'm, I'm in Powell's seat, I'm, I pat myself on the back and say, job well done. And 
the risk, my real risk is that I cut rates and inflation resurges, and then I have a real problem. Now, while I advise against making short-term investment changes solely based on one person's opinion, listening to senior portfolio managers like Eisman can provide valuable insights into the short-term dynamics of the market and help individuals manage their expectations accordingly. Even if the market doesn't perform well in a given year, there is no need to worry for long-term investors. Considering the current circumstances, I believe the market will remain bullish in the long term. You think about what generative AI did to the stock market this year, right? Yes. And that's really what infected the Magnificent Seven and really buoyed the stock market in a year where you just mentioned earnings. They didn't grow much this year. So my question to you now is that the stock market has realized a lot of the enthusiasm about this technology. What do you expect it to do in 2024 for actual earnings? You know, other than NVIDIA and maybe AMD and, you know, maybe some Microsoft, I don't think you're going to see that much of an impact on earnings in tech yet. If it's not about earnings, then what is it? When discussing public companies, they can be categorized into two groups. The Magnificent Seven, which is Amazon, Alphabet, Meta, Tesla, Apple, Microsoft, and NVIDIA, and the broader S&P 500. The estimated earnings growth for the entire S&P 500 is 11 to 12 percent, whereas the Magnificent Seven is expected to achieve an impressive growth rate of 20.8 percent, while the rest of the market is projected to have earnings growth of 6.7 percent. Currently, NVIDIA stands out as the primary beneficiary of the AI boom. While there are other players in the market, NVIDIA takes the lead with its data center revenue, particularly from graphic chip sales. These chips play a crucial role in powering generative AI models, leading to a record revenue of $4.3 billion in the first quarter of 2023. The number skyrocketed to $10.3 billion in the second quarter, marking a remarkable 141% increase. By the third quarter, they had reached $14.51 billion, tripling the revenue in just six months. In contrast, other companies have mainly focused on building their AI infrastructure. It's still going to be very story driven. You know, what I'm most curious about is, other than the very, very large tech companies, nobody really yet has a real AI story to tell. And the question is, is anybody going to emerge? He meant that it would be too early to determine the most significant beneficiary of the AI revolution. And I share the same belief. This is because it's plausible that the companies that will become synonymous with AI in 10 to 20 years might not even exist at present. To illustrate, consider the advent of the internet in the early 90s. While people began using the internet during that period, major internet companies that we recognize today didn't emerge until the early 2000s. Technological limitations back then, such as internet speed constraints unable to handle video streaming at a certain bandwidth, contributed to the absence of companies like Netflix or YouTube. Similar constraints exist in AI capabilities today. Therefore, the companies currently leading the way in AI may not maintain the same position in the next decade or so. As we sit here, U.S. debt 34, just went over 34 trillion today. Is there a scenario where there's a debt concern, debt problem in 2024, some sort of credit crisis that you're looking at? 100% no. Is U.S. debt an issue? Contrary to other prominent figures like Ray Dalio and J.P. Morgan expressing concerns about the U.S. debt, Eisman believes it is not an issue. Despite the recent surge in national debt to $34 trillion and a debt-to-GDP ratio of $1,223, with the interest rate on the debt doubling since 2021 from one6 to 2.97%, Eisman remains optimistic. Where to invest? Regarding investment advice, Eisman has frequently emphasized his lack of confidence in banks as viable investment options. While he acknowledges that larger U.S. banks may fare better than regional banks, he anticipates challenges in growing earnings due to declining deposits since mid-2022, restricting their ability to offer loans. Additionally, post-pandemic, a significant portion of bank assets shifted into long-term treasury bonds at rock-bottom interest rates. Eisman continues to advocate for investing in the Magnificent Seven. Again, that's Amazon, Alphabet, Meta, Tesla, Apple, Microsoft, and NVIDIA. For index fund investors with money in the S&P 500, this provides exposure to the stocks of the Magnificent Seven, which make up over $12 trillion of the S&P 500's total value of $40 trillion. Therefore, 
Holding an S&P 500 ATF means 30% of the investment is in the Magnificent Seven. Beyond this, Eisman expresses interest in investing in infrastructure in the coming years.